Amazing. Thank you so much, Alessandro, for the invitation and to CIST for organizing this meetup. I'm Fabio Petroni. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak about autoregressive knowledge retrieval. Uh, just to give you an introduction, most of the work I'm going to present is part of the research I've done in while I was at Meta in Facebook AI research. Uh, more recently, I commanded the company that is focused on knowledge discovery and applying these technologies to the, to the real world. Um, so given I don't have that much time, I don't want to go. So first of all, this is not just my work. It's a work of a ton of people, a lot of collaborators. So a big uh, thanks to all of them. Uh, so I don't want to convince you Convince you, the knowledge graph is not the way to go. I think we had an information that you meet up. If you want, I can convince you later. Uh, so the way to go is text. Knowledge should be represented as text both for humans and for machines. I think machines now have amazing capabilities to understand text and all the knowledge that is contained in them. Um, we created the benchmark um, a few years ago. It's called KILT, uh, knowledge for knowledge-intensive language tasks, where we um, open sourced a bunch of... Um, uh, actually, we collected the bunch of tasks that were already available, both or slot filling, open domain. So slot filling is the task of giving an entity and a relation, try to get the object, uh, open domain QA, dialogue, and so on and so forth. So I just want to briefly describe the benchmark because it's the one we mostly use to evaluate our models. Um, and we use this benchmark to evaluate a bunch of options to uh, retrieve knowledge, in particular case from Wikipedia. And I mostly um, divide these uh, approaches into two main groups. So there are models that have all the knowledge inside the parameters. So you can use, for instance, a language model like ChatGPT. You ask them questions to it, and it works to, to some extent. Or you have models that have explicit access to the knowledge. And this knowledge can be static. So you pre-compute a bunch of stuff. You pre-compute an index. You pre-compute dense uh, vectors, and then you use these vectors as uh, inference. And so you can use a sparse approach like BN25, a dense approach. We discussed it about vector based approaches before. Um, but uh, the main problem of, uh, uh, that I see in these representations is that they, can't, they are not really contextual. They cannot take into account the question why created the representations. So the representation are static are there, no matter what is the input. Um, can we do something better? Can we like create model that can take into account the input while searching? And um, there are approaches that do that, but mostly, given they are super expensive, uh, you mostly do it for a ranking. So you get a bunch of candidates, you actually look and do a fine grain analysis on them, uh, but just over a subset mm -hmm. of, of candidates. And, and the question that I want to answer in, in this talk is can we build interaction-based models that are efficient to run and that can be used as first stage retrieval directly? This is the main question. Okay, let's try to answer. Um, and I think the answer is yes. And, and the idea is that if you use an autoregressive language model and you, and you pair this language model with an efficient data structure that kind of drives the generation towards all the knowledge you have in your corpus, you can actually achieve this goal. Um, I'm going to present two problems of increased complexity. So we start simple, and then we go into something a bit more complex. The simple, in quotes, problem is entity retrieval. So given a question, for instance, or an input, an information need, whatever you want, you want to get into the page in Wikipedia, that contains evidence to answer that question. Like in this particular case, when did Homo sapiens appear on planet Earth? You want to go into timeline of human evolution. And this is tightly connected to entity linking or other problems that involves finding a set of entities that are relevant to answer a particular question. Um, and the, the, the approach to do entity linking um, um, that we have used in the past. And I think we, we have seen a, a similar approach also before we, we work to get back for synonyms generation. It's basically you, you treat every single element in your collection 
as a different atomic label. And then you try to build a representation for every single entity in your collection, for instance, or in general, every single object you have. Um, yeah, a, a popular approach again is um, searching in that space with maximum in the product search. And then for instance, here, you want to disambiguate Jaguar in the input. You, you are going to create a representation for all the entries you have in your collection. You do uh, maximum in the product search, and then you, you can do some uh, computational expensive uh, red anchor on top of your results. Now, we had a really simple idea. Uh, uh, so first of all, what are the limitation of these approaches? It's extremely uh, large to store. Uh, so these vectors are large. There are approaches to, to make these uh, vectors small. I think uh, at the beginning today, we discussed about one bit representation or other approaches to make them uh, super small. Uh, but anyhow, you cannot avoid to have huge memories to represent a large collection of data. And also, but I think the main problem is that if you represent all the knowledge in these vectors and you make it small to say uh, storage, you're going to miss a lot of interaction between the input and all the entities and all the, the stuff that you represent. And also these models are super difficult to train because uh, you usually train them with a contrastive approach. So you need to pay positive data and negative data. And, and to mine negative data is an art. You need to do uh, a lot of work with art negatives and so on and so forth. Actually, uh, we have a representation for entities that is already available, at least in Wikipedia. And in particular, every entity is an, an, an unambiguous, highly structured and compositional name that interacts very, very well uh, with the context in a really predictable fashion. So for instance, if I see a mention of John Smith in an uh, article about astronomy. I know that this is probably referring to the astronomer John Smith as a human. It's very easy for me to do that class association, as well as if I say, uh, see John Smith in a, in a document about a movie, for instance, that's probably the actor, even if I don't know anything about these entities, just by looking at the title. And yeah, we exploited this. Um, property, and we created a system that simply generates the disambiguated entity name given an input. Um, so it's a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model based on, yeah, any autoregressive model you can think of, GPT or uh, P5 or, or whatever you like. I think we use part in these experiments. And yeah, I mean, um, there is a lot of knowledge in the titles of the entities. Uh, sometimes, uh, the system needs just to specify the type, like Metropolis is probably the comics because I'm speaking about Superman in the input, or it compose uh, context from the input and the entity dimension to come up with the correct entity name. Like this railway station is probably the one in of O1, but it's not a random railway station. Uh, sometimes it just needs to translate, sometimes it's I mean, the mention is, exact, is an exact copy of, of the dialogue, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and there are a lot of advantages for, with this approach. If you are effectively cross-encoding and, and doing this contextual retrieval by using an autoregressive model, because each time you generate a token, you have access to all the question or all the input from, from, I mean, a user. And so you can exploit the input while retrieving. Um, the memory footprint, of course, is order of magnitude smaller than uh, storing all the vectors. And you can train the model just with positive data. Um, I mean, this is, again, we use part. Uh, but there is a problem. I mean, one of the problems of these models is that if you leave them free, again, to generate whatever they like, they will generate something that is not a valid title. In general, it's not in your valid collection of stuff you want to retrieve from. So the, but, but the solution is pretty simple. 
is that you constrain the model to generate only from the valid uh, subset of elements. And with titles, it's super easy. You can build a tree or generate prefix tree that store that tells you, okay, these are the tokens that you can generate after this prefix and so on and so forth. Um, and so just by conditioning us on this prefix tree, you can force the model to generate only a valid uh, company name in your collection. And yeah, uh, these were some experiments we have done. I think this is a paper we published in 19 years, quite a while ago now, I think it was 2021. It, um, and yeah, again, order of magnitude less memory and uh, comparable uh, parameter size for the model. And yeah, the results were outstanding. We managed, at least on, on this benchmark, on all these tasks in the, in, in the guild, uh, benchmark we wanted to improve results by uh, a huge margin. Yeah. We had on average more than 13 points uh, in, uh, yeah, this was the, the precision uh, of the model. Ah, precision in particular. I mean, it was a bit of an unfair um, comparison because it was quite early stage guilt at that time. I think nowadays, and there are models, I think this, I took this screenshot probably one month ago, uh, there might be other submissions, but so for some tasks, we now have some models that manage to beat generate by, by quite a margin, but for instance, for anti-linking, we still very close to the top. There is corpus brain now that achieve about 0 0.1 better performance, but, but it's still very, very close to the top in terms of uh, our precision and, and reward. Yeah, uh, we also have a multimodal. Mo uh, I mean, of course, you can apply this, this idea of the multimodal uh, representation. And the idea is that, it, uh, I mean, people always think that, no, at least in the literature, we should have a single representation for entities that is language agnostic. And so we convey all the knowledge for these entities in this representation. We say uh, exactly the opposite. Let's represent entities in as many languages as we can so that we can leverage as many connections with the input language as possible. And then, for instance, here, um, the current entities was GPS. We, we then merged together all the uh, generation that refers to that particular entity in different uh, languages. Okay, now the, the, the interesting part, the most interesting part that is also really relevant with in general, general information retrieval. Okay, you show me how to uh, get to a Wikipedia page given a question, but now how can you go to a specific passage in, in, in a page? So how can you retrieve fine-grained text from a huge collection of data using this approach? And yeah, I mean, of course, building a, a tree will not, does not really help in this case because how do you decide what is the unit of knowledge you want to build the tree on top? You can, I don't know, as in the dense retrieval approach, you can split the page in passages of 100 tokens, but then you are forced to start by the beginning of this passage and maybe the information you're looking for is more ahead in the, in the passage. In general, um, we cannot really use it a prefix tree to represent a passage in a, in a corpus. Uh, is, is, and we can, in general, represent all the boss. So the idea is the following. If I have another regressive model, like GPT-4, and I force the model to generate a valid substring that exists in the corpus, I'm doing the trivial, basically, because I'm retrieving that particular uh, substring that is in my corpus. Now, it's really, really unfeasible to store all the substring in a corpus in a prefix tree. But luckily, we have two amazing researchers, which are Ferragina and Manzini, Manzini that they recently gave us flash in Ferragina. Ferragina. <laughs> uh, and they recently won an ACM award for, for exactly for this work. And the idea, what they came up for, 
is a data structure that is called the FM index. It's basically a really efficient data structure to uh, store all the possible substring that exist in a collection in a corpus. And yeah, I, I, I think I will not do a great job at describing it, but yeah, I will try. Um, so the idea is that you start with an input string that is your full collection, all the documents ever written in English. And then you try and you came up with a set of um, a rotation for this input string. Uh, then you sort this rotation and you get just the last column to represent the, the input. So Panama banana can be represented as A, a N, M, 2, uh, N, and so on and so forth. So you, uh, you collapse when you have multiple uh, characters uh, close together in the last column. And this is a lossless compression, it's completely irreversible, and it's actually used by BZ if you have to use this um, algorithm in the past. Anyhow, the nice part of this FM index is that we can do um, count in a time complexity that is independent of the corpus size, but it's just dependent of the pattern we are looking for um, and the vocabulary size. Um, and so this means that I can do lookups into this data structure in a really fast. Um, and so basically I can say I'm generating something. Homo sapiens appeared in, okay, was the, is this uh, substring in my corpus, yes or no? And this will tell me um, um, uh, the answer in, in, in the time that is proportional to this pattern size and the logarithmic to the vocabulary size that is. All the English vocabulary is pretty small. Okay, so now I probably got where we are heading. We pay this um, data structure with an auto regressive language model. So we can generate directly a piece of text in the corpus that contains evidence to answer uh, the query. So in this case, causes of CO2 increase, we can generate something that we know is grounded in text because the FM index also tells me not only if that string of course in the corpus, but also where, which is the document that contains that particular piece of uh, text. Uh, yeah, and again, the memory footprint of an FM index is actually smaller than the text itself because I show you that this has been used to for compression algorithms. So it's smaller than keeping the plain text and you can still reconstruct the original text in a lossless way. Um, and yeah, I mean, performance, this is on, on, on Kilt. Uh, this is the DPR was a, a dense passage retrieval, a dense model to do. Uh, Retrieval in general, this, this solution was uh, better than other approaches, not only like some fancy autoregressive approaches, but also um, what was the state of the art at the time. We published this on Neolips last year, I think it was December. Um, um, and, and this more in general, I don't think this is the end of the story. Uh, this, we, we kind of scrape, uh, I don't know, scrape a bit the surface with this idea, but I think there is a lot of potential because in a solution like this, and like the M25, you don't make any back of word assumption, you consider your corpus in the regular order of uh, as the token of words. And then like those methods, you explicitly model the interaction between the query and on the documents, like at inference time. We got strong results on some academic data sets. Um, but I can tell you that also, in, uh, I mean, in production on real use cases, it's starting to work really well. And it has awesome properties because the inference cost is independent of the corpus size. The model and index are completely decoupled because you can have your GPT-4 pre-drain and then keep adding stuff to the FM index or whatever structure where you store all the substring in your corpus and you need an incredibly small memory footprint. 